Okay, so we're going to talk about connective tissue. We'll dive into the role of fascia in rehab. This is largely based on basic science and our understanding of how connective tissue behaves, what's its role, uh, what are some of the components that it's made up of. This will help drive our intervention. So the objectives for us are to understand the properties of fascia, integrate basic science into really making good, sound clinical decisions based in evidence, and trying to optimize our outcomes with our patients. And so gaining a greater understanding into the role of connective tissue and fascia will help us. We're also going to be introduced to several leaders in the medical field that are studying fascia, are big proponents of us just having a holistic understanding of that. To get us started, we're going to watch a video uh, by Gil Headley. He's an anatomist. He's huh, really funny, uh, very, very brilliant, spends a lot of time trying to, to really dive into the meaning of what he dissects and what he understands from that. So you guys are going to watch it. It's a great video. Uh, it's about five minutes, so um, let's just watch it together. thing about the fuzz. I'm going to try and do it account. Okay. So, we've seen the fuzz. You can see it now. I'll put it in over my voice. The fuzz yields to my fingertip. Sometimes I come across a stronger, thicker strand. It doesn't yield to my fingertip. That represents older fuzz sometimes, or maybe it represents a nerve. But each night when you go to sleep, the interfaces between your muscles grow fuzz potentially and in the morning when you wake up and you stretch the fuzz melts we melt the fuzz that stiff feeling you have is the solidifying of your tissues the sliding surfaces aren't sliding anymore there's fuzz growing in between them you need to stretch every cat in the world gets up in the morning and it stretches its body and it melts the fuzz in the same way that the fuzz melted when I pass my finger through it when you're moving, it's as if you're passing your finger through the fuzz, just like I did on the cadaver form here. So you have to stretch and move and use your body in order to melt that fuzz that's building up between the sliding surfaces of your musculature. The sliding surface, those shiny white surfaces of the rectus femoris sliding against the vastus intermedialis. So these uh, sliding surfaces are all over your body. And the fuzz is all over your body, and as you move, you melt the fuzz. Now, what happens if you get an injury? Ah, my shoulder. My shoulder is stiff now. I'm holding my shoulder. I go to bed. I wake up in the morning. I don't stretch my shoulder. I'm afraid it hurts. So I'm walking around like this. Last night's fuzz doesn't get melted. I go to bed. I sleep some more. Now I have two nights' fuzz built up. Now, two nights' fuzz is more fuzz than one night's fuzz. What if I have a week's fuzz or a month's fuzz? Now those fuzz fibers start lining up and intertwining and intertwangling and all of a sudden you have thicker fibers forming. You start to have an inhibition of the potential for movement there. It's no longer simply a matter of going, ooh, ah, stretch. Now you need some work. Now you might need to do a more systematic exploration of that place to restore the original movement that you lost. And usually this is the case. We have a temporary injury then we restore our movement. But sometimes we call this aging. The buildup of fuzz amongst the sliding surfaces of our bodies so that our motion becomes limited, the limit cycles become introduced into our normal full range of motion, and we start to walk around like this. We're all fuzzed over. Our body is literally solidifying. We're reducing our range of motion in, in individual areas of our body and you know, for our entire body in general. So. I believe that one of the great benefits of body work, whether it be massage or structural therapies or uh, physical therapy or any kind of hands-on therapy, uh, these types of therapies introduce movement manually to tissues that have become fuzzed over through lack of movement, whether the lack of movement is because of an injury and a person is protecting that injury or because of uh, personality expression. 
Well, it was many years when I just walked around like this, so I was very still and monk-like. So, and then I became a little more dynamic in my personality when I realized what I was doing to myself and the kind of life that I wanted. So, you can grow fuzz by choice or by accident or whatever, and yet here, now you've heard the fuzz speech, you know that you can take responsibility for melting the fuzz, and if there's too much fuzz in your body and it's frozen up, you might want to seek help in order to introduce movement so that the new cycle is a little more movement and a little more movement and a little more movement instead of a little less movement, a little less movement, a little less movement. Fuzz represents time. The easier it is for me to pass my finger through the fuzz, the less amount of time it's been there. If i got to whip out my scalpel to dig my way through one otherwise sliding surface and another, you know that that's been building up for a long time. So you can actually see time in fuzz. That's the fuzz speech. So pretty uh, wonderful guy and just uh, really awesome to listen to. So I'd suggest you guys listen to some of his r recent stuff. He has another YouTube video out where he kind of breaks it down into um, just things that are good. We're looking for in good healthy fascia and then what we see when there's disease or disorder or maybe stagnation. So uh, just one of those references for you guys to dive into and enjoy uh, the way he speaks because he's pretty easy to follow. Uh, makes us all want to go out and stretch a little bit, right? So, okay, so let's jump in. Foundations and science. We're just going to review. We know that there's four primary tissues of the body, right? Our epithelial tissue is uh, really the role is for protection, um, plays a role in secretion and absorption. And then muscular, that's pretty easy. We know that that plays a role in contraction, uh, our nervous tissue plays a role in sensation and con conductivity. So uh, just how important that is to making sure everything is running, up and running and smooth and coordinated. And then we have our connective tissue, which has a lot, a lot of roles in our body. But um, things just for us to know, one, it, it provides support. So it's a supporting structure. And as you can see here, even in this pic picture, there's a supporting um, layer and we see that it gives support to the tissue layers so if we look right through here this is where it's providing support even into that system and provides those sheaths around our muscle muscles and then even down into our fibrils nutrition so nutrition is highly important so we know that nutrition is carried through through a lot of these and the matrix in and of itself allows for um, nutrition to be in there and hydration we know that hydration is very important um, plays a role in defense so we're knowing that there's an endocrine uh, level to this and then coordination if this is bound down and stagnation in our connective tissue or maybe just uh, that our uh, ligaments and tendons are not providing uh, that ability to contract as smoothly. So those are all things that we would consider uh, very highly important. Uh, just a few others. So there's separation. We saw that. We see that even right here. It separates our muscles from each other. And then balance provides equal equalized balance. So when we look at our postural screen, what are we looking at? We're looking for symmetry and balance throughout the system. Helps in movement, is that tension framework or connective tissue, right? And then helps with shock absorption. So that's why we want some good, healthy tissue that way. But what are our soft tissues made of? Oh, let's erase that for us here. Um, you know, we have a lot that goes into what our soft tissues are. And you guys will read just some some literature, the, the research right now, the... There's kind of a debate on what's defined as soft tissue, what's defined as fascia. But for us, we're going to know that it's this list, right? So it's fibrous tissue, ligaments, tendons, fascia, skin, fat, synovial membranes, muscles, nerves, blood vessels. All those, don't need to write those down, those are all right there for us. Uh, understanding that the soft tissue and those fibrous tissues play a role together and where those fibrous tissues are found, uh, they're really, if we look at the orientation, they're they're parallel bundles of collagen fibers. So if we think about where are our fibrous tissues at, mostly it's that dermis, so the outer layer, our tendons, and our ligaments, which will play a big role 
in providing that strong support that we need to make sure that we don't get injured. Okay, so what's the functions? Uh, I bolded the highlighted words for you guys. So just coming back, there's a lot of words on these slides, but I just want you to, to really think about it. And if you think about the orientation of soft tissues and you go come back to our list of what is soft tissues, then we can easily identify what is our function. So if we think about the structure, it provides pathways for our nerves, our blood vessels, and our lymphatic vessels. And it's highly important that these are uh, free of stagnation, right? So what happens if you have stagnation in a blood vessel? We know that that starts to become arthrosclerosis, where we get hardening, uh, where we get a buildup, where a clot might start to, to form. So very important, our lymphatic vessel, right? So what happens if our pathway for our lymphatic vessel is, is blocked? Well, then we're having pooling and taking place, and so we're not moving the fluids out like we should. We know that it's a supporting matrix, and this is really highly important. So this supporting matrix is to allow for our organs and all of our structures to, to not just drop to the ground, right? So we know the effect of gravity. Uh, facilitates movements between adjacent structures. So can you guys think of a, um, adjacent structures that are connected by fascia that now work in synergy with one another? Well, what comes to mind for me is if you think in the, in the back, we think about our lats are orientated up here, and we know that our lats, combined with the thoracolumbar fascia, attach all the way down into the glute med and create this now kind of cross-relationship and tension network so that when we move, we have tension into that system and helps us provide stability to our joints and areas helps uh, minimize local effects of pressure and friction. So think about our bursa. It contains fluids that participate in nutrition. So bringing really important nutrition to our uh, at our cellular level and our cells that way. Just a few more. So it aids in our ability to promote circulation. Um, and it's in, it encases our veins and lymphatics and, and uh, really is important in, in promoting that. And so we, that's where we come in as manual therapists. We help in that circulation. So if you think about injury levels, so if you think about an acute injury, we can very much help move some of that fluid and stagnation out of the area. We're going to apply a uh, very gentle stretch to that or or even a gentle manual intervention to that but we can definitely help that uh, form space and storage of fat to conserve body heat so this is important uh, to help us thermoregulate and we can start to see in some dysfunctions of this that thermoregulation begin, becomes um, taxed fibroblastic activity so this is where we will talk a lot in a little bit and we'll look at the fibroblastic cycle of where this is hugely important this is ideal for us to be able to repair ourselves and the body is amazing at that but this becomes dysfunctional and then that repair keeps happening and we need to make sure we can stop that it helps in defense, so it helps with bacterial invasion, and they're just studying even more with the involvement into the endocrine system and what's contained in the connective tissue that way. Um, synthesizes antibodies uh, and neutralizes antigens. So, I mean, wow, guys, this is like a very comprehensive list, right? So just keep coming back to what is all involved and what does that look like, okay? Let's dive in a little bit. Sorry, I keep forgetting. That. Let's dive in a little bit uh, more into a couple of different people that are, I think are really integral in us understanding the role of this. So, and you'll see the citation here, but uh, Schlepp, Finley, uh, Chatoow, and Hying, and then we're going to get into Myers here in a little bit. But they came together and defined fascia as um, forming a continuous tension network throughout the human body covering and connecting every single organ, every muscle, and every nerve, and every tiny muscle fiber. So that's what we'll come to as we think about what fascia is and how do we define that, okay? Let's uh, 
we're going to talk a little bit about the properties of fascia, and this helps us in our ability to really understand what we're doing as manual therapists. Because again, the, you know, they've done some studies on just basic effleurage, massage, and uh, there's not a lot of great studies out there. Some of it shows that possibly it's a placebo effect. Sometimes it helps with pain regulation. Sometimes it doesn't. So I wouldn't exactly say that we have a lot of good um, evidence on people who are in the physical therapy, coming into physical therapy, and we are doing a lot of um, manual work on them. And that goes for joint work as well. We're getting better at this, but until then, we're going to let basic science help drive some of our clinical decision making. So this is a review from when we uh, very first talked about what connective tissue is and the properties within that. So let's just think about that it's a colloidal. So it's that solid material. So colloidal and it's suspended in fluid. And that we want to think about our resistance is proportionate to the velocity of our application. So velocity. So remember when we were working on each other, if you work on someone fast, you're going to meet a lot of resistance. And so we want to go at things a little bit slower so that we are actually allowing adaptation to, to happen. Remember there's a high, high collagen content within that system and it's the protein that's responsible for this colloidal proper, property. Uh, I like this quote, if forces applied gradually, energy is absorbed and stored within the tissue and that we might have some good therapeutic in implications into that. So elasticity, guys, is really what we're going to do to uh, assess someone. So if you just hold up your forearm right now and you push on your forearm, most of you have nice elastic recoil where it deforms as you press, but it reforms right to the to the shape that it was before. I'll tell you, it with dehydration and with age and with poor nutrition, this that ability of that tissue to have that elastic recoil drastically changes. And so, if we have tissue that's dehydrated or um, there's stagnation within that that resiliency is not as, as strong. And so when we think about if on a scale from 0 to 10, 0 being really light, you know, 0 to 1 to 2 pressure, that's where we're at appetizers, versus we want to really make some deformation into the tissue, now we're getting to a 9 or to 10. If someone comes in with low elastic recoil, we're probably going to stay in that early pressure range because their tissue is not going to absorb that energy very well and the stress is almost going to cause a harm more than it will good so just things for us to remember okay so let's talk about hysteris that's that process of energy storage and energy lost um, so this might be that explanation for why myofascial therapies work and why neuromuscular therapies work is that we're transferring energy into the system to create a, a cellular change and a chemical change to happen. Uh, plasticity. We, we really are driving that we're overcoming that elastic property, right? So we want to think about... Um, are we going to make a single intervention? Are we going to make long-lasting changes? And what do we need to make sure that if we want someone to get better for longer, it really does rely a lot on what they're going to do after they leave your treatment station. So um, we need to make sure that they have a lot of good home exercise programs and that we always ensure that they're doing some quality movement to, to keep what we just got them. Okay, so just let's just briefly say that fascia is uh, impressively uh, adaptable, meaning that it will adapt to new scenarios very quickly. It will adapt to postures. Um, so this is huge in us thinking about we actually can make a change within that fascial sheath and therefore make a change throughout the system. Um, the increased uh, strain will adjust the fibroblastic matrix and we'll adjust that remodeling activity. So they did a study on women who had a C-section and they studied the uh, women 15 years post uh, cesarean. So they found that if, the mo if that women could have 
fibroblastic activity still occurring up to 15 years post C-section and that those fibroblasts had wound themselves now into the intestinal tract. And if we think about what happens, okay, I have a baby, I'm now into this crouched position, I've had a surgery really low into my abdominal area. And uh, a lot of our society, now we don't sit, so we don't reach up, we don't stretch that area, we don't teach it how to do that, and we don't do that early on, and so now that fibroblast doesn't know what to do. So it keeps, uh, keeps providing um, stimuli, and it keeps laying down new uh, fibroblasts until it's actually told what to do. So that can help us. For me, uh, I'll... I really, it, visual, so I'm going to show you guys a brief one minute YouTube video on um, what fascia looks like and behaves like under the skin. It's uh, pretty phenomenal. It's a, a very cool matrix to actually see and it looks like fibro, uh, fibro optics. That's what it reminds me of. So let's take a look at that and then we'll come back together and, and talk a little bit more about anatomy trains and some more influences into our intervention. With rings that reinforce the solidity like an articulated bamboo stem, transparent sails, dew drops. Travel along these pearly structures and you notice the same fractal arrangement everywhere. Large fibrils endlessly punctuated by other smaller ones. The tissue continuum is total, the marriage homogeneous and the arrangement completely fractal. A world of fibrillar chaos. The human body would seem to be one and the same tissue that has differentiated over time, but whose basic organization is stereotyped. Yet this organizational framework supporting life must have its inherent rules of behavior. How are these structures organized? How do they resorb and move and what There's a longer 28-minute video. You guys can just Google strolling under the skin if you'd like to see that. Uh, there's also a lot more that we'll get into with Tom Myers. He's a great, uh, really, researcher to follow. But just to give you guys an example of what that looks like, some of the other videos will actually show what happens during a manual intervention, and it shows that the, the really small trunks of the of the fascia that we just saw will break off and join another one and so constantly redesigning un, under our um, skin and so pretty fascinating for us to know that uh, okay so in your manual therapies book there is a lot of discussion on anatomy trains and so Tom Myers is has been uh, doing a lot of he's a lot like Gil Headley so an anatomist PhD who studies uh, anatomy and what's the role of that and so as he has done you know thousands and thousands of dissections he started to see a patterning of our fascial lines and so they um, they are sheaths of fascia that are interconnected and as he started to dissect he could start to paint patterns into where these connections were were from and movement one thing about this picture that I really think is phenomenal for us to just really come back to is that we are connected. So if we think about even just this wrap around right here, and we talk a lot about that anterior body wall, right, and what that tightness will look like, it would also lead us to think about what's happening right in this in the center. So what's right underneath here, that diaphragm, here's our xiphoid process, so right into here. And if you guys just feel on yourselves, do you feel any restriction as you kind of follow through that base of the ribs or that cross right into there? And so understanding that, that's just a really crazy uh, idea that we are so connected that way. And then if someone's coming in with dysfunction, we really do want to dive in deeper into why they're having dysfunction. This posterior line is very thick. It's one of the um, the reasons I think we we 
want to think about the occiput all the way down to that PSIS, these really strong connections that go through there. And we want to be able to apply our manual interventions into that long sheath and make a big difference into that. We see these offshoots into the latissimus dorsi as well, and that's where we start to see some of the cross into the front of the body. These will help drive our patterns in which we apply our manual therapies. So we're going to talk about these. We'll use these as we go through connective tissue and why we're going to use those to go through that. Some of the lessons we've learned from anatomy trains. So they're continuities and that we're not separated, we're not isolated, that things are con they're continuous within and of, of each other. That we have these different tracks that we can follow and different um, thicknesses to those tracks as well. The fascial planes can divide and then they can also blend together. So there's different thicknesses that will help us with that. And if we think about our deeper single joint muscles and those are our local muscles versus those bigger global muscles, what those might encompass and what those might need support from our fascial system as well. And then lastly that when the rules get bent, so when there's derailment into the system, so asymmetry, when there is stagnation, when there's injury, that derailment happens and now we start to see some um, poor motor, motor positions and planning because of that. So I think it's important for you guys just to um, know these. I don't think we really need to dive fully into this. This is detailed into your book. I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a summary onto these and thinking about that superior front line, the superior back line, the lateral line and then the spiral lines and what each of those encompasses. You should be able to picture those and, and be able to think about where they start, how that might affect some of our processes through which we will make decisions into that. So for an example, I might have that superior front line and I, I want to know that it's bilateral. I want to know that it goes from the top of the foot all the way to the skull. Um, it splits at the pelvis and that it encompasses the shins, the quads, the rectus abdominis, the sternum, and then the sternocleidomastoid. So that line goes all the way through. And, and so thinking about what's the effect if I've got uh, shortening or maladaption in some of those areas. So just review those. Um, I would say be able to more identify the the picture more than the total words and understanding the bigger muscle groups that are involved in that will be uh, very helpful to you guys and in, in as we make our clinical decision makings. Okay, so what's driving our interventions is, is just review for you, but making sure that you're coming back to what's, what is Hooke's Law. So can you answer that right now? Do you guys remember what Hooke's Law is? Uh, is Hooke's Law the same as Wolf's Law or is it different? Uh, so it's a little bit it's a little bit different, right? So it's that stress imposed on tissues and the degree of the force being applied is directly proportional to the, to the strain produced within the elastic limits of the tissue. So it's a lot like Wolf's Law, right? That we need to impose stress into the tissue and so that they know what to do, right? And that is, you know, the picture right here, inducing stress into the tissue with the use of a, an ASTEM tool. Whereas Wolf Law is that tissues remodel in response to forces or demands placed on them, and that thinking more Wolf's Law is, is probably where we think a little bit more of the bone, bony matrix into that. And then what also is going to drive where you're at is those stages of healing. And so really understanding... Are they in an acute phase where there's lots happening? So just yeah, reviewing this uh, inflammatory and that there's this overlap. And we know we talked about that within um, you guys a while ago. So you guys stick to what you were taught in your other class. But I just, I think for the sake of our discussion, we just want you guys to understand that there 
can be a very quick healing response that's happening and that there's a lot of overlap and it depends on how people are taking care of themselves, what is the state of the organism when injury first happens, how long that will happen. So we know that smoking will prolong the healing process. Uh, we know that diabetes will prolong the healing process. We know that stress will prolong the healing process. So just keep those in mind as we start to think about that. Okay, guys, hydration is key. It is uh, two-thirds of our fascial tissue is comprised of water. And so if we have a dehydrated person coming into us and we're not seeing results, we're not seeing an expectation that we should, it's, it's extremely important that we have that conversation. Um, it's been pretty cool as we start to study the influences of manual therapies and mechanical stress it shows that it's like a sponge. So if we squeeze a sponge, that as we release that sponge, the sponge will now take up a good amount of um, uh, good water, basically. And so that we can create a pumping action within our system by providing a manual therapy. Also so that external loading can result in refreshed hydration. So that's the same idea that we're trying to put into the system a stress to change the matrix underneath of it and to change the, um, the stagnation underneath of that. Also showed that the application of a mechanical load can help replace bulk water zones in the extracellular matrix um, with bound water mo molecules. Uh, we don't need to dive into what all of that means. What I really want you guys to understand is that bound water is a healthier con uh, um, constituent. So it's made up of healthier um, balance between all of the chemicals within, within that body and that extracellular matrix. And so our mechanical load can help change that and be create a more healthy environment. Uh, what does hydration mean? So really, hydration it, it is a means of a transport, right? So we, we know that if we're dehydrated, our blood gets thicker, things get slower. So we want to make sure that we have really healthy tissue that way. So everyone wants to go get a drink of water right now. Hit pause, right? Go get a big drink of water. It reduces friction, uh, acts as a heat buffer. So that's highly important as we're putting our manual stress into there that we're trying to, to help our patients understand that we need them to be hydrated to go through that. 99% um, of the body's chemicals require water. How crazy is that? So uh, we know that a trigger point is a maladaption of the Krebs cycle. So the Krebs cycle is overacting and so it's not stopping and our manual intervention will go in there and help that but also can we help our patient reduce some of that tension system by just having that discussion on hydration we know that it provides volume we know that it helps with the lubricants between our joints okay uh, lastly just think about that fluid is reduced the sympathetic reflex activity caused by pain can follow so it's just that this can really affect those. So I think a lot about someone with maybe who's being diagnosed with chronic pain, who's had an injury, maybe that just has now turned into a chronic injury. We know that not only is there centralization of that pain, but there's also stagnation into that area, and there's probably poor nutrition and poor hydration. Those are things we can help change. Let's talk about... Um, Let's talk about just a little bit of tissue and aging. And so if you think about just even your tissue right now, where you feel like you have really good elastic recoil, we're probably going to understand that there's more fluid within that. There's more elasticity. There's uh, mineral content is lower, so there's not as much calcium buildup in there. Um, that we'll see faster recovery and we'll see an increased global range of motion within our, our tissue. Whereas we start to think about older tissue, there's less fluid, there's more fibrocartilage, meaning that, that within that fibroblastic cycle that we're starting to move into tissue being more um, thick and dense. Uh, there's possibly deposition of calcium, not listed in here, but there's also deposition of fatty tissue into the, to the connective tissue, which we don't want. Decreased mobility and increased stiffness, so that's kind of innate. 
this is kind of a cool study just to guys just to show you uh there is on the top row young healthy muscle and if we look at it, it appears pink and uh pink and red in contrast the old muscle is marked by scarring inflammation there's uh the yellow is fatty deposits within that uh, the difference between the young and the old tissue uh, occurring with the muscle's normal state and then it now also shows what happens after immobilization. And we can just see it just does not look like it should, right? So we see this young, um, young healthy tissue and, and this normal state of the healthy tissue and how much separation we see within those. And then we see this old, now it's infused with thickness and fatty tissue we can't really see the clearly defined separations between that so if we look at that uh, that older tissue versus this younger tissue and then what's happening with this with this immobilization and how messy this starts to look whereas our younger tissue does a lot better with immobilization so just things for us to consider is how we're going to help reform that whoops uh, okay, just a couple more slides. So soft tissue behavior, soft tissue should translate and it should glide. So structures should glide within one another and we should know that. We know that trauma equals binding down in an abnormal state. So can we help that even if there's, um, if there's a broken tissue or broken bone, can we help that binding from being reduced? Binding starts to put pressure on uh, places that it shouldn't. So it's not just nerves, but it's uh, really, if we think about our vascular system, our lymphatic system, um, and our organs, it can become very detrimental to our health. Uh, our tissue behavior is extremely adaptable to physiological load. So that's not just us. It's maybe talking to patients about external load and applying those ACSM guidelines. Are you really doing that? So... Now, let's just keep that in mind as we move forward. Scar tissue is, uh, there's a difference between fibrosis and scar tissue. And we want to understand this because it is very, it's very different in how it behaves. Fibrosis is going to be uh, the entire tissue area. And I'll show you in the next slide. You're going to see the picture. It's typically cyclical. And it can be uh, an irritant that keeps producing and is keep going on until the stimuli acts to stop that. Whereas a scar, it has clear-cut stages of healing. And so that's when you'll go through every single stage, and there will be kind of an end to that stage. There's, it's a linear in its presentation. Usually it's multiple layers, depending on if it was a scalpel that did it or if there was a superficial cut, whatever the injury is. And like I said, there's completion. So if we take a look at this picture, we can see just the difference between the two and, and what that's really helping us to understand. See how the scar tissue is very linear, right? So we know that this scar tissue is making a difference. Now this is just the normal matrix underneath of that where we can make a difference, right? Maybe we can't, we might apply a superficial stress and try to affect these tissues down below, but this scar tissue is very, very, very thick, and uh, we want to mobilize it to the best we can, but we're thinking about also the tissue and structures underneath of that. Whereas we look at the uh, fibrosis here on the left, and we start to see this cyclical nature of fibrosis, and as it keeps forming, it's going to keep forming more of this cyclical nature and take up some of that healthier tissue and lay down more thick forms of that, whereas we see that this side is healthy, and so is this tissue, right? This is kind of that healthier matrix, and so is this. So are we going to really try to use our principles and apply manual stress to help improve things? Absolutely. This is an important slide for you guys and to understand and to really think about what's happening in the case of postural abnormalities or are we sitting too much or maybe I, I broke my foot and now I'm on crutches for a prolonged period of time. So what, what happens? We know that lots of different things can happen, but let's just start here. There's abnormal movement that occurs. So abnormal movement occurs, so now we start to get an irritant within the tissues. 
the irritant at, tells the body that something's wrong. So it says, something's wrong, I need to fix it. So our macrophages come in, they're like, doo, doo, doo. I'm going to come in and help out. And what also is, is interesting is we also know that there's increase, increased vascularity. So it's we want to send lots of our troops in to heal that tissue, right? So now I'm starting to lay down collagen and I'm starting to see that there's fibroblastic activity and that um, I'm going to keep this up until my body says that I'm, I'm okay and the abnormal movement stops. But now I've increased that production of connective tissue. And then we see that there's increased... Uh, activity of the myofibroblastics activity. So now it's introduced into not just the outer extracellular matrix, but now we're in, involved in most of that. And because I'm starting to lay down more and more, right, and we saw that cyclical uh, thickening. So it's thickening, it's thickening, but it does it in kind of that circular manner. So it starts to take up more and more and more of the tissue. And so now we're starting to get, like we talked about, if there's a knot in your shirt and it starts to be cyclical and now we have winding of the tissue, that abnormal movement still continues. We haven't unwound this tissue. So our manual intervention, we want to come in and apply some mechanical stresses to take this away, right? To try to get this to stop happening right? And we need to fix that abnormal movement so that the irritant stops and we can stop this cycle from happening again. We see that if we don't, then we start to get densification into the system. And so, uh, which is not that great, right? So if I have a thicker area right here, that's supposed to be thin, like that's strolling under the skin, and now it's dense and it becomes harder to move, this is going to take a lot more manual therapy. And sometimes we're going to think about our contractures and are we really able to make a change now? Or is that, has this become a permanent state for, for the person? Really like this quote, um, Dr. Harvey Bickelson. It's uh, there's a constant expansion and contraction based on outside air pressure as much as internal volume, unless it's blocked. Soon as our flow starts to stagnate, the body tries to open it up. Flow, stagnation, and inflammation are interdependent. Their relationship changes as they balance each other. Release the stagnation and allow fluid to flow, and healing will follow. So I want you guys just feel your upper traps right now, right? So like stagnation, we know that this, that upper trap being tonic has changed its true role. And so what is that? That's stress, that's poor positioning, that's probably not enough stretching. There's a combination of that. So if you came into me uh, with some neck issues, some shoulder issues, I'm probably going to want to think about all of that stagnation that's happening and how I'm going to release that to make sure that fluid is really flowing like it should. Just another picture to show you what starts to happen as there starts to be densification within the system. So you can see that there's just nice striations here, right? But as we start to get fibroblastic activity, it starts to become thicker. And it starts to decrease that ability of the myofibrils to go through that action potential as fluidly as they should and will affect our ability to move. And so we want to really make sure we're staying mobile and healthy. So this is uh, re should be a review for you guys. It's just a nice graph to show what happens if there's a, a tissue trauma. Um, and so what does the role we play into that? If I come into that muscle tear here, I can probably help with some of that stagnation and even how the fibroblasts lay down and help give them control of what they should be doing and, and help them identify their role so that they actually lay down and behave like they should and don't turn into something else. This is another great site just to show you what happens as we start to have scar tissue forming and how thick that can be and what that does. So it looks at how um, we can really increase uh, microcirculation through our interventions. We can help promote capillary endothelial cellular repair through that because we know that our manual therapy can increase 
circulation and increased vascularization. It can help accelerate granulation. Um, it can also help with just additional vasodilation, which we talked about in angiogenesis. So pre-injury, nice healthy tissue, um, injured tissue, it's, it's broken and the matrix is, is sloppy. Um, and then healed, whereas if we come in and we help that lay down in a more uh, significant way, we're going to help with that, okay? Um, what's a trigger point? So a trigger point is an abnormal um, buildup or an abnormal uh, circular formation of fiber, fibrous tissue. And we know that the, the um, trigger point will act like a... Uh, it will constantly go through that fibrotic cycle that we just went through, but it will also have an abnormal Krebs cycle, so its chemical uh, chemical makeup is changed as well. And so our physiological input into that will start stop to will try to interrupt that and make that a little bit um, better. So we would apply an intervention into this area. If this were too tender, I might go at that in different ways where I would probably apply more of a lengthening or um, uh, effleurage or a little bit lighter touch through this way and try to free up some of this tissue, then maybe go at it here. But if it's not tender, I'm going to try to get this to relax. We can use a dry needle. Um, needling will affect that. It helps actually interrupt that Krebs cycle and helps relaxation with that. What happens is if I dry needle, I create a lesion. So now I might apply some of my bigger manual therapies and longer swipes through those fascial trains to now get those uh, retraining of the myofascial structures to happen earlier in that cycle. Okay, guys, so our intentions. It's to repair, remodel, and restore function, right? So we know that each person has that in, uh, genetic in, inherent um, ability to heal itself, but there's so much that goes into it. The biomechanical uh, body that we're looking at and working with, that psychosocial component, we know that there is overlap within that and that we might be in, in that ability where we're helping and we're mending and we're facilitating an environment for healing and change, but this might go through stages of healing in a different way depending on the different stresses that are involved. Um, our goal is to help remodel the structure and form so that function is now restored. But you have to bridge this with therapeutic exercise and neuromotor retraining. We have to retrain that, that neuromotor system. So just keep coming back to that, that it's the whole person that we're looking at. It's their acquired habits. It's their acquired patterns of use. It's if there's been developmental changes within their body or if there's a disease or disorder present um, or if it's just their uh, current state of life that's creating some of this as well. So these are our intentions as we go through and move through that. We talked about our graded pressure as we're using that. Um, just make sure that if we're using our grades 9 and 10, that we're only doing probably two to three swipes and that we're balancing between this lighter area where we're doing grades one through three, then we're, we're moving on and we're always assessing to see what is my patient's tolerance, is my patient's buy-in, and do I need to do it? If I don't need to go aggressive, then I'm not going to. So I'm going to stay in that nice, nice area. Okay, lastly, our goals use manual loading principles compression and tension techniques to affect the tissue of hydrodynamics and to make ultimately a positive effect on our patients' lives. Great job, you guys. You did a good job. I know it's a long lecture, um, and I hope you in, uh, enjoy some of it and take a look at those videos and some of those other people that we talked about today and just uh, go out and, and stretch after you listen to the lecture. Talk to you soon.